Good evening. Hello. I have cancer. How are you? It was the so-called comedy routine, so real, that changed her life and her career. But what may have mattered to all of us, it was never really her top priority. To me, my biggest break was getting on stage and doing an open mic. I couldn't believe I was actually doing that. It was such a dream in my life. And since then, she's been in multiple movies and shows, but remains refreshingly humble. I'm not going to tell Meryl Streep I'm an actor, you know? <laughs> I'm not going to look her in the eye and say, yeah, I'm an actor. Actor, podcaster, comedian, whatever that means in the moment, Tig Notaro on The Pulse. I just want to do what makes me happy in the moment. And if it's dark, then I'll go dark. And if it's nonsense, I'll, I'll do nonsense. Guys, welcome back to another episode of The Pulse. We've got another great guest doing big things, using her voice for good and so much more, which is what we love to do here on The Pulse. Comedian, actor, author, you got all kinds of titles. Tig Notaro, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Which of those, which of those titles work? They all work, right? They all work. I mean, I feel like a comedian um, and podcaster, uh, mostly. And, um, and then I, you know, end up in some acting gigs and TV and film. And I don't know if real actors would be like, oh, yeah, she's, a com she's an actor, but I do it. So real actors. I was talking to my producer, Ivana when she mm -hmm. scheduled the interview. And I had just gotten back from vacation. And she was like, we got Tig Notaro. And I was like, oh, cool. And then said that I had just on the plane, one way there, I watched, what did I watch? We have a ghost. I have been waiting for this moment for so long. And then on the way back, I watched Your Place or Mine. I have to finish this program before the end of the year so I can apply for that open senior accounting position at the regional school district. Oh, I love it when you say a bunch of sexy words like that. <laughs> and had no idea that we had you booked. Those were just two movies I selected. So it sounds like actor. Well, I mean, in those cases, yeah, I, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was in a movie. But I'm not going to tell Meryl Streep I'm an actor, you know? I'm not going to look her in the eye and say, yeah, I'm an actor. You should see my stuff. Only watch two movies going back and forth <laughs> to vacation. That's and they hilarious. were both you. So we'll go with it. I was also excited when she said, we have booked Tig Notaro for the show until I saw an interview you did with Stephen Colbert. And you were explaining how your agent or friend or someone used to get upset with you because you say yes to everything. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't be too flattered having me on here. Um, no, that was all um, my uh, my work. Uh, not I mean, interviews are, are work, I guess. But um, but TV and film and all these different offers that would come in, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that. That sounds fun. I'll do that. And and my my old manager, she said, she called me and said, "Are you? Do you need money? Are you are you broke?" <laughs> it's like, no. Why? And she said, "Well, you just you you take everything." And I was like, "Why well, get cool offers? You know." All right. So then I I can be excited that you said yes. yes this wasn't yes, one of those. Yeah. Just, this is a cool offer. Let's go back a little bit. How'd you get started in comedy? Well, I was always obsessed with it. Um, I followed stand up. I bought albums and went to shows. And then when I moved to L.A. Uh, with some friends, I, um, I saw that there was an opportunity to do stand up in coffee shops, bars, clubs, laundromats. I mean, you could get on and you know, stage or stage in quotes, um, so many different places. And it was just secretly a dream that I had always wanted to do. So I did it. I tried it and became instantly obsessed. And now I'm 26 years in. Um, but I started at open mics and 
just uh, worked my way through the clubs. I feel like you guys who do this are just a special breed. And I, I can't imagine if someone said to me, you should go do an open mic. I go, okay, <laughs> let's go do it. That's just born into you. It just was never in my orbit, the, the open mic scene. But moving to Los Angeles, there was just a lot of opportunity. And, um, but yeah, it does seem like an odd thing if you're not on that trajectory for someone to suggest it and then you go try it. But I, I guess that does happen. Yeah, I guess. I, I, somebody said it to me, I'd be like, yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna pass on that. What was the big break? It's, there's so many different big breaks. To me, my biggest break was getting on stage and doing an open mic. I couldn't believe I was actually doing that. It was such a dream in my life. And to have that opportunity and be on a stage for three minutes, trying it out, that was the biggest break I could get because it was the beginning. And then, you know, Zach Galifianakis, um, you know, that was a break. He had his own TV show. He had me come on there and, um, you know, a, a booking agent saw me in a club and told somebody else. And then I got booked all around the country and then i had a very big moment in 2012 when i had cancer and my mother had died i had an intestinal disease i had pneumonia my girlfriend and i broke up it was all in four months and i did that i i talked about it on stage and that exploded and became like the number one selling comedy album in the world that year Coming up next, what it's like to share your most personal challenges live in front of thousands. And then I had this fear of, oh gosh, what if I offend people? What if somebody in the audience has cancer? And then I was like, oh wait, I have, I have cancer. cancer. Diagnosed with cancer. <sighs> Feels good. Just diagnosed with cancer. Oh my God. Like, why did you decide to be that open? Um, well, I had just watched my mother die unexpectedly and I had three potentially deadly illnesses simultaneously and I didn't know what my outcome was gonna be. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this was gonna be the last show I was gonna do before I went away and had surgery and got treatment and um, and just took some downtime to recover emotionally from everything I'd just been through. And so I thought I would love stand up like we just discussed. It's my first love. And so I was going to miss it. And I wanted to do another show before I went away and healed. In 2012, you walked on, I have it written down, you walked on stage and said, hello, good evening, I have cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's what started that. I had come up with that opening line of, hello, good evening, I have cancer, how are you doing tonight? I, I, I came up with that in my shower that night before I walked on stage and I was maniacally laughing, thinking, oh my God, that is the craziest <laughs> intro. And then I thought I have to do it um especially because i'm laughing this hard about it and um and then i had this fear of oh gosh what if i offend people what if somebody in the audience has cancer and then i was like oh wait i have, I have cancer, cancer. Yeah. yeah this is this is my story why do you think it it resonated with people so much like you said it became the number one you know recording that year well it is a mystery, um, but I think that, I think there's a lot of different elements. And one is there's, it, it reminds me of reality shows, how people like to watch things as they're going down, dramatic unfolding of events, and, and you're a fly on the wall. Uh, I think that there's something appealing about that. I also think that the material um, touched on so many things that people relate to and everyone knows somebody that's been touched by cancer, love, loss of a loved one, a parent, 
um, a romantic breakup. All, there was so much in there that people could connect with. Mm -hmm. so, so did that kind of change the way you viewed comedy? I mean, you talked about that. You obviously, there's a t-shirt on your website right now when you, were, you appeared on stage after a double mastectomy, uh, topless. You then mm -hmm. did a series of kind of dealing with, with, you know, your mother's passing. And you know all this because you did it. It's been 11 years since that happened. And I feel, I feel like it was just another stepping stone and, and growth um, in, in my process and career because I've, I've had all sorts of changes where I, I did one liners to storytelling to um, musical uh, comedy to very personal dark comedy. And now I just, I feel like I just want to do what makes me happy in the moment. And if it's dark, then I'll go dark. And if it's nonsense, I'll, I'll do nonsense. I, I just, I don't want to be any particular thing, but if somebody, wants to call me any particular thing, that's their business. Next, she's well known in Hollywood, but notoriously unfamiliar with other celebrities. It's me and Hathaway from Anne Hathaway. Yeah. And I was like, that's hilarious. Kool-Aid Man, I guess, is aware when people buy Kool-Aid. More importantly, if he's busting through a fence. That means he was waiting in their neighbor's yard. So what's next? You said you're not an actor. You're on tour. You're doing the podcast. <laughs> um, I've seen you in 50 movies and Star Trek stuff. And yeah. like, it's hard to say what's next to somebody who's kind of doing next right now. But what's next? Well, I'm going to be on the new season of The Morning Show. I love with that Jennifer. show, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure when it airs yet, and um, and I have another stand-up special that I'll be taping in Brooklyn on November fourth, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to take this time off, hang out with my uh, family and my kids, and do some traveling and um, gear up for my stand-up taping, and then. You know, um, I was telling people before this interview that I feel like Tig Notaro would be my friend after I saw that you're not terribly into pop culture, run into celebrities and don't really recognize them. <laughs> like, yeah. What happened with Anne Hathaway? I was in Toronto for the rap party for the Star Trek series that I was on that just um, finished uh, the final season. So what? You're just going to sit there i'm offering moral support and you're in great shape right i mean for two hours i've just heard about how pain is not in your vocabulary the creator and i were standing in the lobby of our hotel talking about to go up to our rooms and this woman came around the corner and she said hi tig and i looked at her and i said oh i said hi i said wait a minute i said were you at the um star trek rap party and she said, no, it's me, Anne Hathaway. She said, I met you at the Beck concert. And I was like, oh, God, I need to just be home and not go anywhere. And, um, and I called my <laughs> wife when I got to my hotel room. And I said, you are not. <laughs> and I told her what happened. And she said, oh, she said, I can't believe that Anne Hathaway tried to jog your memory by saying, it's me, Anne Hathaway. I met you at the Beck concert, um, and Stephanie said, I watched you meet Anne Hathaway at the Beck concert, and I could see on your face you didn't know who she was. And she said, and, and, and my wife said, what she should have said to you is, it's me, Anne Hathaway, from Anne Hathaway. Yeah. And I was like, that's hilarious. I had a show called Under a Rock with Tig Notaro. Yes. And I don't know if you saw that, but I had mm -hmm. celebrities come on and I would try and figure out who they were. I feel like this is the, the example of celebrities. They're just like us. Like regular yeah. <laughs> people sit there and run into people. I know I know you, but I'm, <laughs> right. I'm going to talk longer to try to 
put it into context. They're just normally yeah. not like superstar actors. Right. You really pull that context. We end every episode of The Pulse with the concept of use your voice for good. That's what we try to make this show about and hearing mm -hmm. what that means to people. So what does that mean to you? I like to make sure that any step I'm taking in my career um, and ways that I'm spending my time is with some sort of positive twist to it. Just something, something positive. What can I find there? Um, because uh, I think that it's it's very easy, even though we were talking and kind of, I, <laughs> I think joking before, uh, which I was, the, about taking every job. I really don't take every job, but if I do find something positive or this can be impactful in some way, then I want to be a part of that. Um, so that's that's what's going on with my decision making. It's inspiring to see somebody who's been so open about so many different things and yet still smiling, still making other people <laughs> laugh and smile, uh, still enjoying oh, it you. every day. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Guys, thanks so much for watching a fun and inspiring interview with Tig Notaro. I really enjoyed that. Hope you did as well. We're going to do something a little different today. Use your voice for good is something we always focus on. There is a tremendous event going on that we wanted to share with you. That's coming up next. Guys, as you know on The Pulse, we always bring in people who are doing tremendous things and hear their stories. It's called Operation 10 City. And we've got two guests, Pastor Ray Bernard, who is the lead pastor of Impact Live Church. And we have Dr. Dolores Thomas, who is the president of Joseph Business School. What is Operation 10 City? Operation 10 City was a vision that was given to Dr. Bill Winston to go into the city to help the poor, to eradicate poverty and to close the wealth gap. But why is it so important to do that here? I mean, Philly needs this. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, when we think about Philadelphia being the largest poor city, you know, uh, I think that's a statistic we shouldn't be proud of as a resident of Philadelphia. And I think the primary reason why Philadelphia is because people have been praying. A part of what we're doing is going into these cities and we're giving gas cards, we're giving septic cards. We're giving away food that could feed a family of four for a week. We're also giving away clothes, not used clothes, but brand new clothes, because people have been crying and saying, Lord, do you even exist yeah. um, post the pandemic? So I really believe we're here because people have been praying. This is essentially a retreat of sharing information and resources. Yes. And um, so, and, and again, both of you, so what actually goes on over those two days, June 9th and 10th in Philadelphia? So on the 9th, there are a couple of things. As I mentioned, there will be a food giveaway, mm -hmm. there will be clothes giveaway, and then there's an expungement program. What we believe is that once there's time served, time is served. But the reality is that that doesn't happen. People with a record, they can't find jobs, um, and so they can't care for their families, they can't become productive members of society. And so the expungement program allows us to team them up with attorneys for them to be able to identify whether or not their record could be expunged and they could become active members of society. On um, Friday, we also have our youth program. They can actually come and learn how to create an entrepreneurial enterprise for the summer. My favorite is actually on Saturday, where we do all the business programs, and that's pretty exciting. Um, and so for those of you who have a business idea or have an existing business, we have something called the business pitch, similar to like a Shark Tank. The first is 10,000, second 5,000, and the third is 2,500. But okay. here's a kicker. If you are affiliated with a church and the church is present to support those who have um, attended and who win, we double the prize for the church. 
and all of this is free for them to enter. Okay, so the church needs to be there. The church needs to be there to support them. And then we have a business expo, and uh, it's a career fair, and it's also a business match program. And then we have workshops, and these workshops are really leaving people with the practical ways of how they can engage in becoming an entrepreneur, how they can manage their wealth, or how they can think about um, you know, how to do a better job as a leader for a company, et cetera. The church needs to be there. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> really needs to be there. I mean, if I were a pastor, you know, as Dr. Thomas has said, uh, this makes this is a this is low hanging fruit. This is probably the best, most practical thing you can do for your congregants. Mm -hmm. You know, to have them come out to be able to receive information that's practical. Now, I grew up poor, so I understand what it what it means like to be able to get some assistance, yeah. and um, and so. I recognize that this is huge. And I think not only from a practical standpoint, you know, in terms of clothes and food, but knowledge. You know, the information that's going to be shared is going to be information that you probably would not get yeah. in school. It's, it's better than free. Because yeah. you can go to a, some conference for free, but you're having this and they're getting resources. They're getting knowledge. Best case scenario, when Operation 10 City leaves Philadelphia on for the next step, what do you hope comes out of it? I, I want this to be something that is continued. In other words, this is not just a one-off. This is something that we want to be able to build on. We want to build a, a, a constituency of a group of pastors, business leaders. But transportation is free to yeah. every person who wants to be a part. And parking is free. And parking's free. We're covering everything. There's no reason not to come. I appreciate you both for coming in. Appreciate Operation 10 City. This could change people's lives. So thank you for sharing it with the Pulse. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Bill. Absolutely.